The Shunned House by H.P. Lovecraft Narrated by the Gibby From even the greatest horrors, irony is seldom absent. Sometimes it enters directly into the composition of the events, while sometimes it relates only to their fortuitous position among persons and places. The latter sort is splendidly exemplified by a case in the ancient city of Providence, where in the late forties Edgar Allan Poe used to sojourn often during his unsuccessful wooing of the gifted poetess, Mrs. Whitman. Poe generally stopped at the mansion house in Benefit Street, the renamed Golden Ball Inn, whose roof has sheltered Washington, Jefferson, and Lafayette. And his favorite walk led northward along the same street to Mrs. Whitman's home and the neighboring hillside church of St. John's, whose hidden expanse of 18th century gravestones had for him a peculiar fascination. Now, the irony is this. In this walk so many times repeated, the world's greatest master of the terrible and the bizarre was obliged to pass a particular house on the eastern side of the street, a dingy, antiquated structure perched on the abruptly rising hill, with a great unkempt yard dating from a time when the region was partly open country. It did not appear that he ever wrote or spoke of it, nor is there any evidence that he even noticed it. And yet that house, to two persons in possession of certain information, equals or outranks in horror the wildest fantasy of genius who has so often passed it unknowingly, and stands starkly leering as a symbol of all that is unutterably hideous. The house was, and for that matter still is, a kind to attract the attention of the curious. Originally a farm or semi-farm building, it followed the average New England colonial lines of the middle 18th century, the prosperous peaked roof sort, with two stories and a dormerless attic, and with the Georgian doorway and interior paneling dictated by the progress of taste at the time. It faced south with one gable end buried up to the lower windows in the eastward rising hill, and the other exposed to the foundation towards the street. Its construction, over a century and a half ago, had followed the grading and straightening of the road in that especial vicinity. For Benefit Street, at first called Back Street, was laid out as a lane of winding amongst the graveyards of the first settlers and straightened only when the removal of the bodies to the north burial grounds made it decently possible to cut through the old family plots. At the start, the western wall had lain some twenty feet up a precipitous lawn from the roadway, but a widening of the street at about the time of the revolution sheared off most of the intervening space, exposing the foundations so that a brick basement wall had to be made giving the deep cellar a street frontage with a door and one window above the ground, close to the new line of public travel. When the sidewalk was laid out a century ago, the last of the intervening space was removed, and Poe and his walks must have seen only a sheer ascent of dull gray brick flush with the sidewalk, and surmounted at a height of ten feet by the antique shingled bulk of the house proper. The farm-like ground extended back very deeply up the hill, almost to Wheaton Street. The space south of the house, abutting on Benefit Street, was of course greatly above the existing sidewalk level, forming a terrace bound by a high bank wall of damp, mossy stone, pierced by a steep flight of narrow steps which led inward between canyon-like surfaces to the upper region of the mangy lawn roomy brick walks, and neglected gardens whose dismantled cement urns, rusted kettles fallen from tripods of knotty sticks, and similar paraphernalia set off the weather-beaten front door with its broken fanlight, rotting ionic pilasters, and wormy triangular pediment. 
What I heard in my youth about the shunned house was merely that people died there in alarmingly great numbers. That, I was told, was why the original owners had moved out some twenty years after building the place. It was plainly unhealthy, perhaps because of the dampness and fungus growths in the cellar, the general sickish smell, the drafts of the hallways, or the quality of the well and pump water. These things were bad enough, and there were all that gained belief amongst the persons whom I knew. Only the notebooks of my antiquarian uncle, Dr. Elihu Whipple, revealed to me at length the darker, vaguer surmises which formed an undercurrent of folklore amongst old-time servants and humble folk. Surmises which never traveled far, and which were largely forgotten when Providence grew to be a metropolis with a shifting modern population. The general fact is that the house was never regarded by the solid part of the community as in any real sense haunted. There were no widespread tales of rattling chains, cold currents of air, extinguished lights, or faces at the window. Extremists sometimes said the house was unlucky, but that is as far as even they went. What was really beyond dispute is that a frightful proportion of persons died there, or, more accurately, had died there, since after some peculiar happenings over sixty years ago, the building had become deserted through the sheer impossibility of renting it. These persons were not all cut off suddenly by any one cause. Rather did it seem that their vitality was insidiously sapped, so that each one died the sooner from whatever tendency to weakness he may have naturally had. And those who did not die displayed in varying degrees a type of anemia or consumption, and sometimes a decline of the mental faculties, which spoke ill of the salubriousness of the building. Neighboring houses, it must be added, seemed entirely free from the noxious quality. This much I knew before my insistent questioning led my uncle to show me the notes which finally embarked us both on our hideous investigation. In my childhood the shunned house was vacant, with barren, gnarled, and terrible old trees, long, queerly pale grass, and nightmarishly misshapen weeds in the high terraced yard where birds never lingered. We boys used to overrun the place, and I can still recall my youthful terror not only at the morbid strangeness of this sinister vegetation, but at the eldritch atmosphere and odor of the dilapidated house, whose unlocked front door was often entered in the quest of shutters. The small paned windows were largely broken, and a nameless air of desolation hung around the precarious paneling, shaky interior shutters peeling wallpaper, falling plaster, rickety staircases, and such fragments of battered furniture as still remained. The dust and cobwebs added their touch of the fearful, and brave indeed was the boy who would voluntarily ascend the ladder to the attic, a vast raftered length lighted only by small blinking windows in the gable ends, and filled with a massed wreckage of chests, chairs, and spinning wheels which infinite years of deposit had shrouded and festooned into monstrous and hellish shapes. But after all, the attic was not the most terrible part of the house. It was the dank, humid cellar which somehow exerted the strongest repulsion on us, even though it was wholly above ground on the street side, with only a thin door and windowed pierced brick wall to separate it from the busy sidewalk. We scarcely knew whether to haunt it in spectral fascination or to shun it for the sake of our soul's insanity. For one thing, the bad odor of the house was strongest there, and for another thing, we did not like the white fungus growths which occasionally sprang up in the rainy summer weather from the hard earth floor. Those fungi grotesquely like the vegetation in the yard outside, were truly horrible in their outlines, 
detestable parodies of toadstools and Indian pipes, whose like we had never seen in any other situation. They rotted quickly, and at one stage became slightly phosphorescent, so that the nocturnal passers-by sometimes spoke of witch-fires glowing behind the broken panes of the fetter-spreading windows. We never, even in our wildest Halloween moods, visited this cellar by night, but in some of our daytime visits could detect the phosphorescence, especially when the day was dark and wet. There was also a subtler thing we often thought we detected, a very strange thing which was, however, merely suggestive at most. I refer to a sort of cloudy, whitish pattern on the dirt floor, a vague, shifting deposit of mold or nitre which we sometimes thought we could trace amidst the sparse fungus growths near the huge fireplace of the basement kitchen. Once in a while it struck us this patch bore an uncanny resemblance to a doubled-up human figure, though generally no such kinship existed and often there was no whitish deposit whatever. On a certain rainy afternoon when the solution seemed phenomenally strong, and when, in addition, I had fancied I'd glimpsed a kind of thin, yellowish shimmering exhalation rising from the nitrous pattern towards the yawning fireplace, I spoke to my uncle about the matter. He smiled at this odd conceit, but it seemed that his smile was tinged with reminiscence. Later, I heard that a similar notion entered into some of the wild ancient tales of common folk, a notion likewise alluding to ghoulish, wolfish shapes taken by smoke from the great chimney, and queer contours assumed by certain of the sinuous tree-roots that thrust their way into the cellar through the loose foundation stones.